This next lecture is going to be all about bone tissue. So remember bone falls under the umbrella of connective tissue. It's the supporting connective tissue. Bone tissue is also called osseous tissue. So a little bit of background about bone tissue in general. Even though it is by itself a connective tissue, it is associated with other tissues. So it consists of bone, which we will talk more about in this lecture, which is structural connective tissue. There's a surrounding membrane that goes around bone, uh, surrounding, surrounding tissue, which is dense irregular tissue called the periosteum that protects the bone. There's articular cartilage, which is hyaline cartilage associated with bones. And so that you, you're gonna find that articular cartilage where bones meet up with each other at joints and it helps cushion the bones. There's blood inside of bones. So remember blood is also a connective tissue. And then bones are innervated by nervous tissue. So, um, so you can feel, you have a, they can sense things. And, or, and so if you injure a bone, your brain realizes it and it hurts. And then there's also adipose tissue, which is another connective tissue found within bone. So as far as functions, so most of the function related to bone has to do with support, but there's also protection. If you think about the, the skull or the rib cage, it's protecting vital organs. And then movement, because bone works closely with skeletal muscle to allow you to move. And then as far as mineral storage and release, uh, calcium and phosphorus are the big minerals that are stored in bones, calcium being the biggest one. And so when your body needs calcium, you can pull it out of the bones. And when you want to store it, you put it back in the bones. As far as energy storage, it's found, it's basically adipose tissue or fat tissue. And that gives us something in bone called yellow bone marrow. And then red bone marrow is a different type of bone marrow that's important in a process called hemopoiesis, sometimes called hematopoiesis, but this is the formation of blood cells. So classifications of bones, they can be classified as long, short, flat, or irregular. And so a long bone just means it has a greater length than width. So it might be your upper arm bone right here, the humerus, as you'll soon learn its name. So it looks like a long bone. Femur, which is your thigh bone, another long bone. Short bones have a similar length and width, so they're kind of cube-shaped. So some of the more common ones would be the bones in the ankle, which are called tarsals, or maybe the bones in the wrist, which are called carpals. Flat bones look like plates or parallel plates with a little bit of spongy bone in the middle. And so a lot of the skull bones, the external skull bones are going to be flat bones. Like this is called the frontal bone, makes up your forehead region. Scapula, which is uh, your shoulder blade. The sternum is also considered a flat bone. So it looks like a little flat plate. And another tricky one is uh, the ribs. So you might look at the ribs and say these look like long bones because they're kind of long. But if you actually look close at a rib, they're actually relatively flat. So most textbooks classify the ribs as flat bones. Then irregular bones are just bones that don't fit into any of those categories. So if you get odd shaped bones like this, the vertebra, those are irregular. Uh, so some of the skull bones, especially the, the bones on the inside of the skull, those are gonna be irregular also. So if we go through the anatomy of a long bone, this looks like the femur, and it is in this picture. So just some of the features that long bones are gonna have they're going to have a shaft, which is called the diaphysis. They're going to have ends on each end. That's called the epiphysis. Plural would be epiphyses. So epiphysis, epiphysis. And then between the diaphysis and epiphysis, we have this little region called the metaphysis. And you see that here also. The, uh, the metaphysis is where we have something called the epiphyseal plate or epiphyseal line. So really quickly, that is commonly known as the growth plate. So when long bones increase in size and they grow, that action occurs at this epiphyseal plate, which is found in the metaphysis region of long bones. Now, after a certain age, bones cease to grow in length. So that's that epiphyseal plate will basically close, and you may have heard of the growth plate closing, and then it becomes more of a line and we'll call it the epiphyseal line. They're actually showing it right here in this picture. And down here, I know it doesn't look like much, but it would be right here. So epiphyseal line is after it closes, 
epiphyseal plate is while the bone is still actively growing. Articular cartilage would be on the ends. And again, that's hyaline cartilage to cushion and protect the bones. Inside the bone, you can see there's a cavity. This is called the medullary cavity or marrow cavity. This is where we're gonna have bone marrow. So um, at the ends of the bones, we're gonna have what's called red bone marrow. And that's what is used in uh, red blood or blood cell formation. So that process of hemopoiesis. And then more so in the middle of the bone, we're gonna have yellow bone marrow, which is adipose tissue, which is used primarily for energy. All right, and so lining the cavity that you can see, you can kind of see some spongy bone in there. And so, yeah, the spongy bone would be on the inside lining the cavity. And you tend to get more spongy bone on the ends of the bones. All right, so looking at this picture, a couple other things. So there's a connective tissue covering that goes around the outside of the bone. That's called the periosteum. And then there is a thin lining inside the medullary cavity called the endosteum. So periosteum is on the outside, and then endosteum is lining that inside cavity. Here's a picture of the periosteum being pulled back. Bone cells uh, are really important for the health of bone. So there's four different types of bone cells. So osteoprogenitor cells are the stem cells. These are, are the cells that divide and differentiate or become other cells. So what's gonna happen is these stem cells called osteoprogenitor cells are gonna undergo cell division and they're gonna turn into these other cells called, oste called osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are bone builders, so they build up the bone. They secrete the extracellular matrix of the bone, which consists of lots of collagen fibers and calcium and phosphorus. And these cells can no longer divide, so they make the bone. And then, at a certain point, the osteoblast will turn into mature bone cells, which are called osteocytes. And so the osteocytes are gonna lie in spaces called lacunae, which is the little space that they're in. And these are the mature bone cells. They help maintain the bone matrix on a, uh, basically uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And the way this occurs is that if you can envision the osteoblast spitting out a bunch of bone, like meaning collagen fibers and calcium, then all of a sudden that bone hardens. And at first it's soft and then it becomes hardened like concrete. And the osteoblasts become trapped kind of in their little pocket. And then when that happens, they're now called osteocytes. And so when the bone tissue becomes hardened or calcified, that's when they actually become osteocytes. So this would be the equivalent of like a concrete truck lying down concrete where it's nice and moist at first where it just flows almost like water then all of a sudden it gets hard when it hardens. So when it hardens, the osteoblast gets stuck in the middle and they're stuck in their little pocket called a lacunae. And that's when they become osteocytes. And so the flow would look like this. So osteoprogenitor becomes osteoblast, which make the bone. Then when they get trapped in their secretions, they're now called osteocytes. Notice the structure of an osteocyte. It has these little extensions. These are important. So then the fourth type of bone cell was, is completely different. It doesn't come from an osteocyte. It comes from uh, the bone marrow. And so uh, osteoclasts are bone destroyers. They break down bone. So they're large phagocytic cells, meaning they basically eat away at bone. They're derived from the bone marrow. Uh, what they, they look like this. They have this little jagged edge on them called the ruffled border. That ruffled border secretes hydrochloric acid, which is a very acidic acid, and it basically eats away at the bone. So these cells are good because it's, it's healthy to have a constant bone turnover. And so you get osteoblasts constantly making bone. At the same time, you get osteoclasts breaking it down. And so bone, believe it or not, is a very dynamic tissue. It's constantly changing. And so this is why if you maybe break a bone, it heals over time because you can remodel that bone with these cells. So the osteoblasts build it up, the osteoclasts are constantly breaking it down just to make sure it is uh, completely healthy and strong.
So the bone matrix, so we have the bone cells that we just talked about, and then the extracellular matrix consists of collagen fibers, which we know are really strong, and then these minerals, calcium and phosphorus. So uh, to, together, this mixture, calcium phosphate and calcium hydroxide, make up a mixture that's known as hydroxyapatite. The important thing is that we know that calcium and phosphorus are in here. So I like to think of this like pouring a concrete slab or foundation. So if you were going to pour a concrete slab, generally you put down these uh, iron rods first, the rebar, and then you pour the concrete over it. So the reason you do that is for strength. So the concrete's going to harden whether you like it or not, uh, but just because it's hardened doesn't mean that it's strong. So the rebar or the rods will give it its strength. So if you relate this to bone, the collagen fibers are equivalent to the rebar, so they give bone its strength, whereas the calcium and phosphate give bone its hardness. And when bone hardens, we call it calcification. So to review compact bone, I know you've seen some of this before, but we're going to go into a little more detail, and then we'll talk about spongy bone. So it makes a solid outer part of the bone. There's units called osteons, sometimes known as haversion systems. We've seen that. Uh, there, the osteons are surrounded by concentric lamellae. And in the middle, there's a central canal or haversion canal that has blood vessels and nerves. And then we also, what we haven't talked about yet, we also get this lamellae on the outside of the bone going all the way around. This is called circumferential lamellae. So concentric lamellae goes around the osteon, circumferential lamellae goes around the entire bone. We also, in addition to the central canal, get some canals running perpendicular. These are called Volkmann's canals or perforating canals. Just FYI, you'll probably see it as Volkmann's on the exam. So they run perpendicular to the central canals. Then some other features. Uh, we have, if we look, kind of zoom in to a, an osteon, you see the osteocytes. They're lying in spaces called lacunae. And the little things that look like cracks radiating out from the lacunae are the canaliculi, the tiny canals. So this is where it becomes relevant that we talked about the structure or the uh, appearance of an osteocyte. Remember it had all these extensions? So all of these extensions from the osteocyte fit into those canaliculi. And it basically, if you look up here, it allows the osteocytes to communicate with each other through those canaliculi. And moving on, spongy bone, sometimes called cancellous or trabecular, tra, trabecular bone, does not have osteons because if you look at this, it does have the lamellae, but it does since it doesn't have a central canal, there, it's not considered an osteon. And we have the big spaces because remember it looks like a sponge. And in those gaps, we mostly have red bone marrow, which is important for blood cell formation. And the structures that kind of make up the spongy appearance or lattice work, uh, that, those are called trabeculae. So trabeculae. And again, we have lamellae. They're called parallel lamellae because they're not going around a central canal. And still get the osteocytes and the lacunae. Along with the can. All right, so a little bit about bone formation. Uh, bones are, there's two strategies, strategies by which bones are formed. Um, most of them are formed via what's called endochondral ossification. So we'll spend more time talking about that. But there is also a strategy called intramembranous ossification, where bone is just formed from the embryonic connective tissue called mesenchyme. So this includes like the flat bones of the skull, some of the facial bones, the mandible, which is your jawbone, clavicle. But most bones are going to be formed from a hyaline cartilage model, and this is called endochondral ossification. This is when we get bones formed due to those epiphyseal plates or growth plates that I was mentioning. So I want to talk. So that's bone growth in length, but bone can also grow in width, which is called appositional bone growth. And this is a little bit easier, and a picture kind of describes it all. So if you kind of look at bone diameter as you go from an infant to a child to a young adult to an adult you can see the bone definitely gets thicker but the important thing to realize is that it doesn't just add more bone to the bone to make it thicker you also increase the size of this cavity this is important for a couple of reasons but one of those being that it 
make sure that the bones don't get too heavy. Because you could imagine if, the, if it was really thick bone with a very small cavity, it would be really heavy. And movement would be rather difficult. So you want to envision it like this, where the osteoblasts are constantly putting out bone on the outside, and the cavity is kind of being eaten away by the osteoclast. All right, so bone remodeling just describes the process which bone is broken down or made and uh, broken down. So it's constantly being broken down and built back up. So one of the biggest things to that you can do to increase the, what's called the bone mineral density of your bones is stress them without injuring them, obviously. So, uh, so physical activity is really important for bone health. So whether that's walking, running, uh, weightlifting, anything that stresses the bone without hurting it is generally going to be good for it, and the bone's going to adapt and get stronger. Otherwise, uh, if, you're, if you don't stress the bone a lot, like if you didn't do any uh, weight-bearing activity or didn't do a lot of physical activity, bones tend to be a little bit weaker because you're not stressing them enough. So this is one of the big things, like if when people go into space or they live on the uh, space station for a while, they lose a lot of bone mass because they don't have that impact of or the effect of gravity that's stressing their bones out a lot. So the bones actually get weaker. So one of the things that they actually try to do in outer space is do physical activity as much as they can to prevent that from happening. Uh, also, bone mineral density tends to peak at about age 25 to 30, somewhere in there. So after that, it tends to go down. So this is the important, stresses the importance of uh, in, young, in earlier life, kids and young adults being very active and doing what they can to increase bone mineral density as much as possible. And so you have more to hold on to throughout the rest of your life. And obviously, as you get older, there's the risk of osteoporosis, uh, which is common where bones become really, really brittle and the bone mineral density really drops. All right, so vitamins related to bone. So in addition to physical activity, I should say, just coming back here for a moment, diet is also important. So calcium and phosphorus getting in the diet is really important for bone health, along with the vitamins that I was going to mention right here. So vitamin A is important because it activates osteoblast. Vitamin C is really important because it's important in collagen synthesis. Vitamin D is important for calcium and phosphate absorption. And uh, talking about a couple of disorders, or at least one disorder right here really quick, there's a disorder called rickets, which isn't overly common in the United States, but it, it, it can happen. So it's really a result of vitamin D deficiency. So vitamin D is important, like we said, for calcium absorption. So what happens in rickets if you don't have enough vitamin D? The bones don't get enough calcium, and they become soft. And so a common... Uh, thing that you see in rickets is that the bones soften so much that you may start getting a bow-legged appearance. So this is the classic sign of rickets. So again, lack of calcium, bones get soft. Lack of collagen, the bones get weak. So vitamin D deficiency leads to soft bones. So as far as bone fractures, uh, there's a few things to say here. Some of these fracture types are named according to where they occur, and some are just general terms. So I just wanted to start, I'll kind of move around here, but uh, let's start with an open or compound fracture. That's where the bone actually breaks through the skin. A closed or simple fracture would be where it doesn't. There's no picture of that, but it's, that would be the opposite, simple or closed. A comminuted fracture is where the bone actually shatters. So you see that here. An oblique fracture is where the bone is broken at an angle. Remember, oblique means angle in anatomy. And then a green stick fracture, you can't really see it that well here, but in a green stick fracture, uh, the bone doesn't break all the way. One side may break the other where the, the other stays intact. So if you can envision kind of bending this, this uh, clavicle, like in the direction it's being bent, that this top part would like crack first before the bottom part. And so if, if that happens, that's called a green stick fracture. So one side breaks, the other just bends. And then Collie's fracture is location specific to the wrist region. So this is the radius being broken, distal end of the radius. And a pot fracture is near the ankle. 
So in this picture, you're seeing the fibula, which is the lateral lower leg bone being broken. So it's near the ankle region. So that's a pot fracture. And this over here is a Collie's fracture. All right, so as far as bone markings go, I put this on here. Uh, I don't want you to stress over this right now because as we go through bones in the next two chapters, you're going to see all these terms and you just kind of have to learn them as we do it. So I don't see a lot of benefit in just memorizing these terms right now. But bone markings are just features on bone. So I'll show you a few on the next picture. So for instance, the femur has a head, has a, something called a trochanter, which you can see is just a big uh, part sticking out. Condyles are common where bones meet. They're usually rounded surfaces. Epicondyles are, are projections just above a condyle. Some of the more common things, foramen, like we said, is an opening. So you get a little hole right there. Uh, tubercle is like a bump on a bone or a raised area of a bone. Tuberosity, same thing. Fossa is like a cavity. Uh, ramus means it's something at an angle to something else. Uh, anything else? So you see a depressed region right here, again, called a fossa. A spine is also another part sticking out. So you'll see a lot of these. Here's another foramen uh, opening. So you'll see a lot of these bone markings in the next few chapters. But again, I think in, it's best to learn them as we go through them. I think you're more likely to remember them that way instead of memorizing what they represent.